The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus in, again in reply spoke to the chief priests and the elders of the people in parables saying, the kingdom of heaven may be likened to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. He dispatched his servants to summon the invited guests to the feast, but they refused to come. A second time he sent other servants saying, tell those invited, behold, I have prepared my banquet. My calves and fatted cattle are killed and everything is ready. Come to the feast. Some ignored the invitation and went away, one to his farm, another to his business. The rest laid hold of his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged and sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The feast is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy to come. Go out, therefore, into the main roads and invite to the feast whomever you find. The servants went out into the streets and gathered all they found, bad and good alike, and the hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to meet the guests, he saw a man there not dressed in a wedding garment. The king said to him, My friend, how is it that you came in here without a wedding garment? But he was reduced to silence. Then the king said to his attendants, bind his hands and his feet and cast him into the darkness outside where there will be wailing and grinding of teeth. Many are invited, but few are chosen. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. As tempting as it is to delve into this gospel, I'm going to leave it aside entirely today and focus on this, first of all, this book of, uh, we're in the 25th chapter of Isaiah. We're in the 700s BC, maybe like the late 700s, somewhere between 750 and, and like uh, 700. And things are not going well in Israel, not at all. As a matter of fact, they're about ready to get deported because they've basically neglected everything. Their, their faith, the taking care of the, the, the following the law, the, it's, the kings were just absolutely wretches and it was just an absolute mess. And Isaiah kept prophesying again and again, okay, watch it guys, this is not going well. The, the Assyrians are gonna come in, the Babylonians are gonna come in and already the, the, the northern kingdom got shipped off and, and just there in the south, they're, they're just hanging out for a little while longer before they're going to get deported. But in the midst of that, in the midst of all these, be careful, watch, you're going down the right path, he has this, this prophecy about what God really wants to do. And that's to have this mountain in which there's this great feast for absolutely everyone. And it's, like, it's almost like they're struggling to come up with words to describe what this feast is going to be like. And he's not talking about a, just an, an, an actual feast. He's talking, this is a, a reference to heaven, to the heavenly Jerusalem. And the, the words just fall short. And so they're just like, well, okay, well, banquet. Uh, that, that's like, so the rich foods, choice wines, and he doubles down on it. Juicy rich foods and pure choice wines. He's like trying to like even like amplify it in some way. <coughs> The Lord God will wipe away the tears from every face. The reproach of his people he remove from the whole earth. This veil will be removed. This is a promise to fix everything. This promise to heal everything. When we look around today, we see an awful lot that needs fixed, an awful lot that needs healed. We can start here in New York. We can go, Father Lewis can tell you all about what Haiti's going through right now. We can get over to the Ukraine, talk about that. 
We can go to the Middle East in seeing how it's just absolute travesty unrolling and having unrolled. This is not the holy mountain. This is not the great feast. We're just ripping at each other. And it's not just the good guys and the bad guys. No, it's us. We're the ones ripping at each other. And we've been doing it since the dawn of time. I want to tell a story here. We're going to go to August 1982. Uh, and this is a, I, I, I downloaded this in an article from, um, I knew the story, so I just Googled the story, and the, the telling of it came up from Asia News from September uh, 2nd, 2016. Author is Fadi Nunes. I want to make sure I'm giving credit where to my proper citation here. And this is about in this is in we're in Beirut in Lebanon in 1982. The Palestinian the PLO Palestinian Liberation Organization and the Israeli Army are fighting, and there's already the toll is already heavy. There's about 500 deaths, and we're in the middle. Um, it's in the middle of August in 1982. A lot of civilian deaths, many wounded, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually, I actually printed it out because I normally don't read from up here, but I think this is worth it. In the besieged capital, water and food supplies were running out. Many neighborhoods were without power. On August 10th, responding to a call that came out through the news, Mother Teresa arrived hurriedly to Lebanon by a small near, nearby port that had, uh, which was predominantly Christian, that had not yet been affected by the war. She had been informed of a situation worthy of Dante's Inferno. There were more than 100 physically and mentally handicapped Muslim children that had been abandoned to themselves by the staff of an orphanage that was located in the western part of Beirut. They had no food, they had no care, there was no staff to help them, some were dying, some were injured from bombing. These disabled and orphans' children were exposed to the airstrikes, abandoned by the medical staff. There were more than, here, I, I've edited a little bit here. The, fa the facility's kitchen was locked. In a panic, the staff had fled in the bombing, uh, and there were still more dead and wounded there. So she arrives, Mother Teresa arrives on August 13th, 1982, and, and this, there's a back and forth that's between her and some people that she's talking to uh, from a transcript of this. There's some video footage of her there. After she landed, Mother Teresa talked to a priest and an officer about what had to happen the next day. She just landed. I feel the church must be present at this time. Mother Teresa tells the two men sitting in front of her, because we are not into politics. That is why we need to be present. This is saintly logic, of course. The priest said, that's a good idea, but you must understand the circumstances, Mother. Two weeks ago, a priest was killed. It's chaos out there. The risk is too great. Mother Teresa, but Father, it is not an idea. I believe it's our duty. We must go and take the children out one by one. Risking our lives is the, is the order of things. All for Jesus. All for Jesus. You see, I've always seen things in this light. A long time ago, when I picked up the first person there in the streets of Calcutta, if I had not done that the first time, I would not have picked up 42,000 after that. And the other gentleman. But, Mother, do you hear the bombs? Mother Teresa, yes, I hear them. The gentleman, it's absolutely impossible to cross over into that zone at this moment. We must obtain, obtain a ceasefire. Mother Teresa, ah, but I asked Our Lady in prayer. I asked for a ceasefire for tomorrow eve on her feast day, which would have been the 14th of August leading into the Assumption the next day. When Mother had Teresa had arrived in Lebanon. She had asked to see the ambassador of the United, to the, of the United States, uh, Philip Habib, who had been sent by 
President Reagan in our negotiated end. According to witnesses, after listening to Mother Teresa, Philip Habib replied, Mother, I am more than happy to have a woman of prayer at my side. I believe in the power of prayer. I believe that prayer is answered. I am a man of faith. But you see, you're asking Our Lady to deal with the Prime Minister. And do, not think, and do you not think that the time limit you gave them tomorrow for a ceasefire is a little short? You should extend it a little. Mother Teresa said very seriously, uh, not at all, Mr. Habib. I am sure that we will have a ceasefire tomorrow. If we get a ceasefire, I personally will ensure, Mother, the arrangements are made for you to go to West Beirut and to be able to evacuate those children. The next day, not 24 hours between her landing and, uh, and this happening, August 14th, total silence enveloped the city. There was a ceasefire. And this is a, a commentary from, the, from a, another witness. Everything was magical, miraculous with Mother Teresa, said Amal Makaram, who witnessed the two-stage evacuation. She was a true force of nature. It was, enough that she it was enough that she crossed from east to west at night. By contrast, I cannot describe the children she rescued. They were mentally disabled. But what is terrible is that we also found normal children with the group who, through mimicry, had learned to behave like these feeble-minded children. But Mother Teresa took them in her arms, and suddenly they flourished, becoming somebody else, like when one gives a little water to a wilted flower. She held them in her arms, and the children bloomed in a split second. Our Lord, here in the prophet of Isaiah, is promising this mountain on which there will be this banquet, this feast, this joy. where every tear is wiped away. You can imagine what that was for those children when Mother Teresa picked them up and wiped their tears away. An experience of heaven right there. You can do that too. And it's the biggest gift that you can give to anyone ever. We're not, I'm not Mother Teresa. You're not Mother Teresa. We're not over there in Gaza right now. We're not in Haiti. We're not in northern Nigeria where the Christians are persecuted. We're not in Ukraine. We're not in any of those places right now. I don't think if I showed up and just asked Our Lady for a ceasefire in any of these places and within 24 hours, I don't think it would happen. Well, me who lacks faith. But what if two of us were to pray for that now? Five, ten. What if we were to sincerely, honestly pray, Lord, cease this now, please? I bet something would happen. Maybe you're not one that prays a whole lot. It's, well, I think that's even better still if you were to pray now, because imagine if one of God's children who never talks to him, all of a sudden talks to him, he's going to listen. Right now, the, in the last few days, the patriarch of Jerusalem asked that Tuesday worldwide be a day of prayer in fasting. So I would like to invite you, ask you, beg of you, beseech you to participate in this. It'll have an impact. We don't know what child's life might be saved, whose soul might be spared. Will it be everyone? Depends on how hard we pray, I guess. 
but I think it will have a difference. So let's take courage and motivation by Mother Teresa's example. Please don't go on an airplane and fly over there. That's for her to do. But you can do something from here. And not just for there, not just for the situation there, but for all the just what we see in our own city, anywhere. Your prayers make a difference. But we have to do them, we have to pray them, we have to mean them. And God will bless that.